Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. This morning, as we return to our studies, especially these that are lined out for us as to the state of the world at the end of time, Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his blessing and his guidance so that we may more properly understand all that has been presented before us by the prophets that have given us warning so that we may more clearly understand what our obligation and our duty is at this time. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath and for these Sabbath hours that we may come before you, that we may join together in worship and in praise. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you have been providing and to the many answers of prayer that you have been giving throughout this past week. We ask you, Father, now to guide us as we open the words of your prophet. We open the words of scripture. We look at the words, symbols, the admonitions that are given. Help us now as we join together that we may become more unified, that we may find that you have been in charge and are leading us even through things that were written many years aforetime. I thank you for each one that is here today. I ask a blessing upon them, and I ask, Father, for a blessing upon those that will view this later. Direct us now. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide us. For this, we thank you. For this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to be looking at this, this manuscript that Mrs. White wrote in 1900. As we have looked at several others in the past, the only admonition I can give is Pay attention. We're going to be looking at symbolic representations. We're going to be looking at different things that Mrs. White has presented here. We're going to look at different things from Scripture. There are going to be questions that I will ask. Pay attention. Be prepared. Okay. Now, as we're going into this, we're going to be looking at manuscript 28 of 1900. <clears throat> this manuscript was typed on the 10th of May of 1900, and it is regarded as a non-published document. Portions were used in the Bible commentary, and portions were used in manuscript releases. Yet, this was not fully presented until 2015. The Lord Jesus represents the whole of heaven's treasures, which have been committed to him to impart to the church in rich, full currents of love and grace and power. If an earthly father being evil gives his hungry child bread, not a stone, a fish, not a serpent. Will God, being good and righteous, deny his children the gift of the Holy Spirit? Upon his children, he bestows his blessings abundantly. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. What symbols are we taking from this? What scripture passage is Mrs. White quoting without reference? Psalm 
Does anybody have one an idea? Is, yeah, there's one in Luke. Luke Luke eleven thirteen, I think it is. If ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, so will okay. your heavenly father give yeah. About the reception of, of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Is there another one? Okay, brothers and sisters, I'm seeing three different symbols right now. Maybe I'm just odd. When I'm looking at this, I agree with what the sisters just presented from Luke. But can we also not find this in Matthew? Would someone please turn for me? Matthew, Matthew 7, 10. How about Matthew 7, 9 to 11? Is there anything that we can take from a symbol of 9-11? Is there anything that we've accepted about this? Matthew 7, 9-11. Seven times coupled with 9-11. Here again, we have manuscript 28. Four times seven gives us 28. We have May 10th or the 10th of May of 1900 when this is typed. 10, five, 105. Now that's interesting from the from the chat. Matthew seven nine to eleven, the reverse Bible verse, seven 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 seven. Tenth of May of nineteen hundred, we get we are receiving one o five. One o five is a fractal of the twenty five twenty. In one paragraph of this document we are being given direction to pay attention for this is for the end of the world the reason why the churches do not understand the word of god is given in the 58th chapter of isaiah in this chapter are laid down the conditions of receiving God's blessings. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden and like springs of water whose waters fail not. And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations. Ugh of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. If thou turn away from thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Isaiah 58, 9 to 14. Let's remember. 
in this chapter are laid down the conditions of receiving God's blessings. If man would receive the word of God just as it reads, power from on high would be given them. Instead of working against God by their disobedience, they would seek to win souls to obedience. Does this not dovetail with much of what we've been studying on Friday nights? Are we not to receive the word of God just as it reads? Amen. Yep. But your iniquities have separated you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Therefore is judgment far from us. Neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. Isaiah 59, 2, 4, 6, 9. I enter. Uh, I I noticed the web, and he they attach he she he attached it to um, um character, the yes. you know the righteous clothing. Remember what we were doing in Samson with the web. Okay. I I was just thinking about that because I I actually read this verse just about twenty minutes ago, <laughs> Isaiah fifty nine right. Verse right. two. Exactly. Right. It's very interesting. And how we were, you know, putting this all stuff together with Samson at the time. That, that word just popped out at me. I'm really sorry to disturb you. Keep going. No, no, no. no. This is not disturbing. This is adding <coughs> to the study. So here again, we are able to see the interrelation in this portion of Isaiah with what we've been studying on Friday nights and what we have been studying recently with this with Samson. All of this is a message to those that would give the final warning message to this world. For if we do not have the strength of Christ, we are nothing more than babes. Samson had the greatest strength of any man. Yet his character was not correctly perfect. The Lord's ambassadors have a message to bear to the world. They are to lift up their voice like a trumpet, even as John the Baptist lifted up his voice in the wilderness, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. A decided testimony is to be born. We must not serve with the sins of the people. For in so doing, we shall minister to sin. Are we looking to minister to sin in any regard? Repeat that, please. Are we looking to minister to sin? In any regard, in any manner. Well, we're not looking to it, but <laughs> we have a tendency of doing it. Whatever the standing or position or the transgressors may be, we must let it be understood that we keep the law of God. By precept and example, we are to give the message of truth whether men will hear or whether they will forbear. In our work, we shall find a high profession of piety. 
and much outward exactness bound up with great inward wickedness. The people represented in Isaiah 58 complain that the Lord allows their services to go unnoticed. This complaint is the expression of hearts unsubdued by grace, rebellious against the truth. Those who receive the truth which works by love and purifies the soul are loyal to God, honoring him by obedience to his law, which is holy, which is just and good. The spirit of true fasting and prayer is the spirit which yields mind, heart, and will to God. Ministers of God have been guilty of the sin of disregarding a thus saith the Lord. Let that sink in for a minute. This manuscript was written in 1900. This manuscript was written 56 years after the Great Disappointment. She is saying here, ministers of God have been guilty of the sin of disregarding a thus saith the Lord. They have led the members of their churches to observe rites, which have no foundation in the word of God, but are in direct opposition to his law. By perversion and misrepresentation of the word of God, they have caused the people to commit sin. Now, are we talking about ministers that are saying that it's okay to disregard the Ten Commandments? Or are they disregarding the right arm of the gospel? Or are they disregarding both? I would say both. In most cases. Yeah, both. In most cases, anyway. God will reward them according to their works. Even as did the priests and the rulers in the time of Christ, they have caused the people to err. Christ says of them, as he said of the Jewish leaders, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. If in this their day men would humble themselves before God, showing true con contrition of heart for their disloyalty, God would bless them. They would not longer stand under the banner of the first great rebel, who, when expelled from heaven, led a third of the heavenly host to unite with him in rebellion. Precious light from the word of God is shining upon us. Christ declared, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whomsoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 17 to 19. If ye love me, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. John 14, 15, and 21. I found it interesting that she would quote this. How much more simply can we place it about how highly the commandments are regarded than this? 
if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. John 15, 7 to 11. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. Is this not a second witness to what Christ was saying? That we know Christ if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a what? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked first john 2 1 to 6 how sad is it that religious people will not come to the light in their examination of the word there is no safety for the churches except as ministers enjoin upon the members of necessity of the necessity of keeping the commandments The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them is their great reward. Psalm 19, 7 to 11. The word of God is our guide, the foundation upon which we must build. One statement regarding the immutability of the law of God should be all sufficient for us. But God has assured us over and over again that his law is unchangeable. And that obedience to it is the only hope of the human family. God gave his law for the government of all human intelligences, and he desires men and women to obey it. Their prosperity in this life and their eternal interests depend upon their obedience. The title of this manuscript, Obedience or Disobedience, sets out clearly for us the two great groups. One that would choose to be obedient and one that would prefer the disobedience. Satan was expelled from heaven because he rebelled against the law of God. 
Is this not clear? Oh, yeah, it's very clear. Adam and Eve transgressed the law and the floodgates of woe were opened upon our world. I find this statement to be a direct rebuke to the pastor that I heard state that Adam and Eve really didn't do anything wrong. <clears throat> we cannot have such giving this kind of a message within the movement. The church should not agree to those that would give this kind of a message either, yet they are allowing it. Christ died upon the cross of Calvary to give men and women an opportunity to gain back what they had lost. Now is our day of test and trial. Shall we not stand before the fallen sinful world in union with Christ, striving with hearts and mind and voice to persuade sinners to keep God's commandments and live? Shall we not exalt the law and make it honorable in the sight of the heavenly universe and in the sight of the fallen world? Shall we not do all in our power to restore the moral image of God in man? I found it very interesting this week that a nurse with whom I'm acquainted two years ago chose to stand up and tell the hospital where she worked that she would not accept the injections that were being mandated upon her. For two years, she stood alone at this hospital. Now, two years later, <clears throat> the hospital has rescinded their mandate and she has been told that she is probably very correct in not accepting these injections. We will be given the test of whether we are going to stand for the law of God or whether we are not. <clears throat> if we are not willing to stand with the right arm of the gospel, if we are not willing to stand for the law of God, the gospel of freedom, then we are making a choice to stand under the banner of the great apostate. Remember that Christ died to save the human race from hopeless sin and misery. By dying in order to give sinners an opportunity to gain eternal life, he bore witness <clears throat> that God's law is immutable and that all who would be saved must render to it reverence and obedience. Those who, after hearing the warning message, refuse to obey, must bear the penalty of transgression, even eternal death. Those who say that Christ, by dying on the cross, abolished the law, state the matter exactly opposite to the way in which it is stated in the word of inspiration. The cross of Calvary will condemn every man and woman who, having broken God's holy law, has refused to repent. Can we find any more blunt statement from 123 years ago than this? No, that one's pretty direct and to the point. What is our great need? according to this statement.
when we come to the cross of Christ, what is to occur? What does the Holy Spirit lead us to? Um, well, to our sinful character, sinful life, to make us uh, realize that Christ gave us self for that sin of ours, and it's basically up to us to to allow him to remove it from us. Does this not show us that when we are led to the cross of Christ, we have a need for the repentance of the sin that we have accepted into our life? Absolutely. The law has not been abolished. Is it not interesting, though, that within the law, these commandments, these ten promises, that the one of the Decalogue that is set aside by almost every church has to deal with the Sabbath. They're not saying that the law is set aside so that we can commit adultery. They're not saying that the law is set aside so it's okay to kill your neighbor. They're not saying that the law is set aside so that we can covet what our neighbor has. It all boils down to the day of worship. Well, that refusal is the refusal of the sign of his power and authority. Correct. But if you break one, what happens? You break them all. God gave the Sabbath to man as a memorial of creation. The world has disregarded the Sabbath because of those claiming to be God's stewards have taught error in the place of truth. The Christian world has accepted a spurious Sabbath, dishonoring God's memorial of creation. Thus, men and women eat of the fruit of a forbidden tree, confirming themselves in disobedience. Thus, Satan gains in the fallen world that which he gained, which he failed to gain in heaven, power to change God's law. The law of the Lord is immutable, enduring forever. It is perfect, converting the soul to perfect obedience to the lawgiver, binding man up with his creator, the owner and preserver of all things. Now, when man is being bound up, what kind of a relationship is this? Well, a covenant relationship. Exactly. Is this not the same covenant that was being given to Abraham when he walked between the divided animals? Yes. All of this is showing our great need to be fully restored to God by our faith in the righteousness of Christ. When we are restored to God in this way, when we are choosing to enter into this covenant with God we are choosing to stand for his character for by standing then for his character we're also saying that our character is dependent upon the righteousness of Christ alone Those who come to the study of scriptures, remembering the words of God, spoke to Moses, take off thy shoes from off thy feet, 
for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground, will see the truth. Exodus 3, verse 5. But upon those who do not want to see it, spiritual blindness comes as their own choice. They have chosen their own way and disregard the way of the Lord. In the beginning, the word states, God created the heavens and the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended the work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his works, which God created and made. Genesis 1, 1 and 31. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. God has set us an example of what he wants us to do. He rested on the seventh day, sanctifying it and setting it apart as holy time. He says to us, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 20, 8 to 11. By this commandment, God is, pro is pointed out as a God above all other gods, for he is the creator of all things. As we rest upon the Sabbath, we are to look at the work of his hands, remembering his mighty power, and his wonderful goodness. The song of Miriam was inspired of God. Led by her, the children of Israel sang, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy hand. The earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hath led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength to thy holy habitation. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them on the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Exodus 15. 11 to 13 and verse 17. When in awful grandeur the Lord proclaimed his law from Mount Sinai, it was his purpose to impress the people with his majesty. It is impossible to the human intelligence to form too high or too pure a conception of God. Who is the God of the Hebrews worshiped? The answer comes back, the God who created the heavens and the earth, who made the world in six days and rested on the seventh. He is not a God of wood or of stone, <clears throat> the product of a man's hands, but a living God and his memorial of creation is the Sabbath. This is a sign between him and his people. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, 
but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy unto the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Exodus 31, 12 to 15. How positive, how definite are the words. By the observance of the seventh day, we may show that we are the people of God. God designed the observance of the Sabbath to be a means of keeping his people separate from the world and of preserving a knowledge of him. Christ prayed, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John 17, 3. A right knowledge of God is everything to the human family. Men and women become holy as they gain correct views of their creator. The observance of the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to God and a pledge of his power and willingness to sanctify. That ye may know, he says, that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Exodus 31, 13. This is his covenant of peace with all who obey him, his pledge that he will do all that he has promised. The Lord passed by Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children and unto the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. If men and women would acknowledge the true Sabbath, they would not, as they now do, despise the word of God. The observance of the seventh day would be a golden chain binding them to their creator. But the commandment which points out who the true God is, creator and ruler of the earth, is dishonored and disobeyed. This is the reason why there is so little stability in the world. The churches have refused God's sign and misrepresent his character. They have torn down God's sacred rest day exalting a spurious Sabbath in its place. Oh, that man would cease to walk themselves out of heaven by their own perversities. Have you ever considered that by ignoring the gospel, by ignoring the promises of God, that there are those that are locking themselves out of heaven? Now, last week we left off here. The document we've just read, Obedience or Disobedience, adds quite a bit to what we are now going to consider again. The religion of error and superstition bore its fruit. Bigotry, cruelty, falsehood, and murder. Isn't it amazing that the religion that brings in so many things different from God, that leads men to be suspicious, <clears throat> leads men to be bigots, to be cruel, to lie, and to kill. These are exercised on the person of the only begotten Son of God. The priests tried in every way to entrap Christ, to find in him something that they could use against him. But notwithstanding the fact that they hired the ignorant fools, the ignorant tools of the enemy, 
to bear a testimony which they had put in their mouths, nothing was found in Christ worthy of condemnation. Three times the judge declared, I find no fault in him. John 18, 38, 19, 4, and 19, 6. Yet instead of protecting Christ as an innocent man and thus earning the reputation of being a just and considerate ruler, Pilate gave him up into the hands of the mob. Directly and simply, Pilate did not have the character to have a backbone. The only begotten Son of God was placed on trial, but it was a mock trial from beginning to end. It was shown to the world that the religion of the Jewish teachers was a religion of oppression. It proved unable to reform them. Tradition and rites of no value, whatever, were exalted above the word of God. Truth and deed had fallen in the streets, and equity could not enter. Isaiah 59, 14. The religious rulers rejected and condemned him who was the light of the world. What does this say to us today? Are we not seeing this same rejection going on in churches all around us. The religious rulers rejected and condemned him who was the light of the world, the one who shone amidst the moral darkness, and who in a moment could have struck off his fetters. Christ was obliged to tell them that by their resistance of righteousness, they had served their day, and that the vineyard would be given to other husbandmen. Claiming to have the only true religion of the world, they turned from truth itself and crucified one who was the truth because he bore witness against their evil works. Light shone amidst the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Injustice and fraud lifted themselves in triumph, and Satan was pleased with the success of his plans. Christ gave the lesson of the blighted fig tree in order to teach an important lesson. For the time, he invested the tree with moral qualities and made it the expositor of truth. Pretentious in appearance, it stood in this orchard, flaunting its rich foliage, as if fruit in abundance might be found on it. But Christ searched from the four, topmost bough to the lowest branches, and found nothing but leaves. He pronounced the curse upon it, and the next morning it was found to have withered away under the curse of him who created it. Master, said Peter, behold the fig tree that thou cursest is withered away. Mark 11.21 By the fig tree, Christ represented the Jewish nation. Her doom was to be as sudden and as certain as that of the fig tree. The second cleansing of the temple, the dispersion of those who were buying and selling in the courts, desecrating the place set apart for a holy purpose. Connected with the blighting of the fig tree was symbolical of the future punishment of the Jewish nation. It prefigured the righteous anger of God, standing as the representative of men of the nation the priests were corrupting the people by their false principles. As the fig tree withered, so would they. I must speak plainly. 
We are reaching a time when a just standard of right and wrong, of honor and dishonor, of truth and error, is becoming a thing of naught. Truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. Isaiah 59, 14. In the ambitious projects invested, there is danger of losing all sense of distinction between right and wrong. <clears throat> Those who listen to misrepresentations are supposed to be acting for the cause. For a long time, a course has been pursued which has perverted principle and justice. We need men who will not be drawn into secret, underhanded confederacy, but who will shun as a sin the least intriguing and underhanded work. Men who will call things by their right name. Men who are barricaded by principle and braced for duty, be it pleasant or unpleasant. Men whom neither flattery, pretense, cunning, nor art could induce to swerve one hair from principle or duty. Brothers and sisters, we need to be able to stand. We need to make this decision. Even if we stand alone. How many today are willing to do this? It is a great dishonor to prevaricate, to falsify, to come to terms with men because they have spoken that which is not true. <clears throat> For the love of a little money to degrade the soul. The word of God condemns all such practice. It is a common thing with some to sacrifice conscience in order to obtain an advantage or to be thought greatest. The man who sits at the feet of Jesus and learns his lessons will say, as did one of old, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. Genesis 49, 6. Those who in heart are not united with the, to the truth pride themselves upon the great show of buildings in the publishing house. If we're not united to the truth, we take great pride in our churches. We take great pride in the, in the, of, of the speeches and the presentations of our ministers. But is this being united to the truth? Though habituated to handling divine interest, the sacred has no more virtue to them than the common, and they do many things deceitfully. They do not bring the sacred word of God to their lips to feed upon as if it was heavenly manna. They may talk the most pointed truth, but they do not love or practice its principles. If we are not willing to produce the fruit that we are being shown here is, ne is needed, then will we not become just as accursed as that fig tree? The enemy has succeeded in perverting justice and in filling men's hearts with the desire for selfish gain. Justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Isaiah 59, 14. In the great cities there are multitudes living in poverty and wretchedness, 
well nigh destitute of food, shelter, and clothing, while in the same cities are those who have more than heart could wish, who live luxuriously, spending their money on richly furnished houses, on personal entertainment, or excuse me, personal adornment, or worse still, upon the gratification of sensual appetites, upon liquor, tobacco, and other things that destroy the powers of the brain, unbalance the mind, and debase the soul. The cries of starving humanity are coming up before God, while by every species of oppression and extortion, men are piling up colossal fortunes. Now, since we have been reading here from Ninth Testimony, we come again to a passage that we are very familiar with. On one occasion, when in New York City, I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify their owners and builders. Higher and still higher these buildings rose, and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belong were not asking themselves, how can we glorify God? The Lord was not in their thoughts. We are living in a time of lawlessness. It is described by the prophets, judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Isaiah 59.14, Hosea 4.2. While but a small part of the evil and corruption of our large cities is ever published, there is enough to make the daily papers a daily comment on these texts. Are we not seeing this all around us right now? The passing days are eventful and full of peril. Signs of a most startling character appear in the floods, in hurricanes, in tornadoes, and in earthquakes, in casualties by sea and by land. The judgments of God are falling on the world that men may be awakened to the fact that Christ will come speedily. The prevailing spirit of our time is one of infidelity and apostasy. The spirit manifested in the earth is a spirit of pride and self-exaltation. Men boast of illumination, which in reality is the blindest presumption. Many do not hesitate to exalt human reason, to idolize human wisdom, and to set the opinions of men above the revealed wisdom of God. The truth, as it is in Jesus, is regarded as an old-fashioned doctrine. Maxims and theories from the world have been worked into the church and vain philosophy, philosophy and science, falsely so-called science, are in, the men, are in the eyes of men of more value than the word of God. Isaiah 59.15 Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment.
The alternate reading would give it to us this way. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil is accounted as mad. And the Lord saw it, and it was evil in his eyes that there was no judgment. I was shown that the perplexed state of our nation calls for deep humility upon the part of God's people. One most important subject should now engross the minds of everyone. Am I prepared for the day of God? God is proving and purifying his people. He will refine them as gold until his image is reflected in them and the dross is consumed. There is a great work yet to be accomplished for God's people. They must possess more of the spirit of self-denial and more willingness to endure, to suffer for the truth's sake. Am I prepared for the day of God? Is a question that we are all to be taking account of day by day. Everything is to be shaken that can be shaken. Everything. I saw that God's people, many of them, will be brought into the most trying positions and that they must be settled, rooted, and grounded in the truth and move from principle or their steps will surely slide. Is this not a great warning to us today? What are we to do? We must move from principle. We must move from faith and not by sight. I was shown the dreadful state of our nation and again was referred to Isaiah 58 and 59, 1 to 5 as a description of the present state of things in our nation and the reason for their present calamity. This is a most unrighteous war. The inhabitants of the earth have forgotten God. They have trampled upon his law and broken the everlasting covenant. They have despised his Sabbath. The fourth commandment was shown to be as a golden link, which God designed should serve as a bond of union, uniting man to man, and connecting earth to heaven and finite man to the infinite God. So if this is to be as a golden link, what are we seeing a reference here for? Was Father Miller not shown a golden chain? Was that golden chain not of prophecy? So can we not make the application that we need the law and the prophets to be able to understand correctly our position in this world? Amen. Yes. But the man of sin has exalted himself above God and has sought to break this golden chain. Yet it is, yet it is not broken. It exists yet and will continue to exist as long as the new heavens and earth remain. Anciently, God went before his people to battle against their enemies. But holy and consecrated ones bore the ark containing the ten precepts of Jehovah. 
And if any had transgressed any one of these Ten Commandments in the Decalogue, God turned his face from his people and suffered the enemy to make a dreadful slaughter. <clears throat> if Israel kept the Ten Precepts, a copy of which was contained in the ark they bore before them, God's angels fought with the armies of Israel. And although their numbers were ever so small, he turned back their enemies and gave them a triumphant victory. Are we not being shown right now? Our need of complete and total repentance Our need of the confession of our sins. Our need of coming into unity before God so that the Holy Spirit may be poured out upon us. Are we yet any different from the disciples that met in that upper room? Of the 120 that met there for those days after the ascension of Christ? Are we any different from them in any regard? If we are not, then is our need of repentance and confession of sin just the same as theirs, so that we may become those that would give this final message. The dreadful state of our nation calls for deep humility on the part of God's people. The one all-important inquiry which should now engross the mind of everyone is, am I prepared for the day of God? Can I stand the trying test before me? <clears throat> what say you today? Are we as a people prepared for this day of God? I saw that God was purifying and proving his people. He will refine them as gold until his image is reflected in them and the dross is consumed. There is not in all that spirit of self-denial and willingness to suffer for the truth's sake and to endure hardness, which God requires. She is telling us that there is not this spirit in all of us. How can we be unified to give a message if we are not unified in spirit? How can we give a message to a world when we are not in agreement with our brothers and sisters. Is this not what God requires of us? Their wills are not subdued. And they consecrated holy to God, seeking no greater pleasure than to do his will. Ministers and people lack spirituality and true godliness. Everything is to be shaken that can be shaken. God's people will be brought into most trying positions, and all must be settled, rooted, and grounded in the truth, or their steps will surely slide. 
if God comforts and nourishes the soul with his inspiring presence, they can endure, though the way may be dark and thorny, for the darkness will soon pass away and the true light will shine forever. I was pointed to Isaiah 58, 59, 1 to 15, Jeremiah 14, 10 to 12, as a description of the present state of our nation. The people of this nation have forsaken and forgotten God. They have chosen other gods and followed their own corrupt ways until God has turned from them. The inhabitants of the earth have trampled upon the law of God and broken his everlasting covenant. I was shown the excitement created among our people by the article in the review headed The Nation. Some understood it one way, some another. The plain statements were distorted and made to mean what the writer did not intend. He gave the best light he then had. Something must be said. The attention of many was turned to the Sabbath keepers because they manifested no greater interest in the war and they did not volunteer. They were looked upon in some places as sympathizing with the rebellion. The time had come for our true sentiments in relation to slavery and to the rebellion to be made known. There was need of moving with wisdom to turn away the suspicions excited against the Sabbath keepers. We should act with great caution. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. We can obey this and not sacrifice one principle of our faith. Satan and his hosts are at war with commandment keepers and will work to bring them into trying positions. They should not, <clears throat> by lack of discretion, bring themselves there. I was shown that some acted very indiscreetly in regard to the piece published. It did not accord with their views in all respects. And instead of calmly weighing the matter and viewing it in all its bearings, they became agitated, excited, and some seized the pen and jumped hastily at conclusions which would not bear investigation. Some were inconsistent and unreasonable, they acted out that which Satan is ever hurrying them to do, namely, their rebellious feelings. Under whose banner are we standing? Under whose control are we? We don't want to be under Satan. I have a comment here about the reference here. Sure. So T09. Mm -hmm. What is that? Testimony 9. So, it, oh, it's Testimony 9. Okay, I see. So that's from First Testimony. Right. It's the, it is the actual ninth testimony that she had written. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Whenever possible, I try to go back to the original published records. I didn't do that this time. Somebody else did. That might have been me. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what was going on with my phone, and I pressed my back button. No problem. So, going on to letter 57, 1894. In regard to Captain Eldridge, I have had to write words of reproof again and again. 
You saw the evil that was at work, and yet you did not move as one in your position ought to have done. In regard to men whom I have had to reprove, the word of the Lord could not have the effect it would have had if you had discerned the evil more clearly and acted decidedly. These words were spoken to me when the state of things in your councils was so objectionable to the Lord. Judgment is turned away backward, and justice, justice standeth afar off. The truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Isaiah 59, 14 and 15. <clears throat> For a long time, the evils existed in the office at Battle Creek. The messages that, that God had given did not have sufficient weight with those who filled prominent positions to change the current of things. I was shown that Satan was jubilant when the selfishness of men was robbing the treasury of God, for he well knew that if they did not place themselves where God could help and defend them, he himself would weaken them and thus prepare them to be overcome by his deceptions in the future. There are some who have not had kindly feelings toward me because they were deprived of these large wages. Such feelings were indulged by Captain Eldridge, Brother Henry, Frank Belden, and others. Never will any one of these men be clear before God until he makes restitution to the Lord's cause for that of which the selfish, avaricious spirit has robbed the work. I was shown that the result of paying such exorbitant wages would be that workers who were really conscientious would be oppressed. The ones who grasp every dollar they could put to their own use would manage matters to please themselves if they had a chance to do so. Some have interwoven selfishness with their work for years. And because of this, have misrepresented the character of our Redeemer. And have worked, walked contrary to his holy standard of righteousness. The counsels of selfish men have been permitted to prevail. And you have dealt unjustly with your brethren in business matters. But every unjust transaction is written in the books of heaven. We may well ask, how may I also... How may I so keep on the alert as to avoid being deceived? How shall I conduct myself that sharpers may not take advantage of me? It becomes a serious question as to how we shall maintain Christianity in the marketplace and in the business transactions when we have to deal with men who are so little influenced by the principles of truth. Truly, the time has come when justice is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Again, Isaiah 59, 14 and 15. How many times did Mrs. White need to repeat these warnings before she was being listened to? How many times do we need to hear this warning for us today before we take these warnings to heart? Are the unjust methods that have been followed in harmony with the will of God? No. They are due to the perversity of men that work contrary to the lessons that Jesus Christ has given in plain and positive language. 
the fact is that worldly spirited men are handling the work of God. They are selfish in spirit, and it has been their practice to grasp and to amass all means possible for the interest in which they are absorbed. In their devotion to business interests, they forget their accountability to God, who is their owner both by creation and by redemption. They close the lids of the Bible after reading the instruction contained therein and go about their work as though the Lord hath not said, Thou shalt and thou shalt not. They are represented as hearers of the world, of the word, but not doers of it. They are not Christ like, for the Christ like worker is not a one sided but as a whole-sided and symmetrically developed man. What is this saying to you today? What words of admonition, instruction, and encouragement are we finding here? There are temptations to meet in every line. We may truly say justice has fallen in the streets. <clears throat> Inequity cannot enter, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Among worldly wise men, gold and silver and possessions of houses and lands measure the value of character. And this has been... And this has been leavening those men in our very midst who claim to be Christians. But shall those who call themselves Christians bring in corrupting principles and dishonor Christ? Judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. This was fulfilled in the life of Christ on earth. <clears throat> he was loyal to God's commandments, setting aside the human traditions and requirements, which had been exalted in their place. Because of this, he was hated and he was persecuted. This history is repeated. The laws and the traditions of men are exalted above the law of God. And those who are true to God's commandments suffer reproach and persecution. Christ, because of his faithfulness to God, was accused as a Sabbath breaker and blasphemer. He was declared to be possessed of a devil and he was denounced as Bezlebob. In like manner, his followers are accused and misrepresented. Thus, Satan hopes to lead them to sin and cast dishonor upon God. The state of the world today is represented by the state of the world in Noah's day. Our transgressions are multiplied before thee and our, our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God. Speaking oppression and revolt conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. <clears throat> and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. 
Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. This is the condition of our world today. And those who are so confused in their estimate of truth and righteousness as to seek wisdom and praise and glory from men are receiving all that they will ever have unless they repent and are converted. Are we to seek the praise and the glory of the men around us, of the wealthy men around us, of those that have attended their schools, that have received their Doctor of Divinity degrees? For who can truly become a doctor of that which is divine? Who can truly become the doctor, the teacher of God? Did either Christ or John attend the, rab the rabbinical schools of their time? And if they had, what would have been the effect of their message? Did they seek in any regard the praise and the honor of the men around them? The message would have been watered down. Exactly. What is the condition in the world today? Is not faith in the Bible as effectually destroyed by higher criticism and, criticism and speculation of today as it was by tradition and rabbianism in the days of Christ? Have not greed and ambition and love of pleasure a strong a hold on men's hearts now as they had then? In the professedly Christian world, even in the professed churches of Christ, how few are governed by Christian principles. In business, social, domestic, and even religious circles, how few make the teachings of Christ the rule of daily living. Is it not true that justice standeth afar off, equity cannot enter, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey? We are living in the midst of an epidemic of crime, which, at which thoughtful, God-fearing men everywhere stand aghast. The corruption that prevails, it is beyond the power of the human pen to describe. Every day brings fresh revelations of political strife, of bribery, and of fraud. Every day brings its heart sickening record of violence and lawlessness, of indifference to human suffering, of brutal, fiendish destruction of human life. Every day testifies to the increase of insanity, of murder, and of suicide. Who can doubt that satanic agencies are at work among men with increasing activity to distract and corrupt the mind? and to defile and destroy the body. And while the world is filled with these evils, the gospel is too often presented in so indifferent a manner as to make but little impression on the consciousness of the lives or the lives of men. Everywhere there are hearts crying out for something which they have not. <clears throat> they long for a power that will give them mastery over sin, a power that will deliver them from the bondage of evil, a power that will give health and life and peace. 
Men who once knew the power of God's word have dwelt where there is no recognition of God, and they long for the divine presence. The world needs today what it needed 1900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded, and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished. Many of the examples that we have been given in this document today are rather hard to take. But is it not better that we face this now than have to face the judgment later? Is Christ not forbearing with us at this time? And should we not take the step to repent and confess so that we may be restored to our brothers and sisters? whether or not they choose to be restored to us. We have to consider carefully, diligently, that which is being said here today. Any comments or thoughts at this time? Shall we then pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these admonitions that we are given. We are able to see our great need of you. We ask, Father, for your forgiveness for our stony hearts. We ask, Father, that we may be restored so that we may come into a clearer understanding of that which you would have of us. Forgive our sins. Direct us, please, so that we may be able to walk in the light that you are presenting. Direct us now. For this, Father, we ask. For this, we pray. And this, we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen.